לכבוד הוא לי להציג לפניכם את הדובר המרכזי של הכנס, דוקטור פרסנה. כן. נקודת הזינוק של הארגון הזה הייתה מאמר שנקרא The Forgotten Prisoners, שאותו כתב פיטר בננסון ב-1961. לדעתי זאת דוגמה יוצאת דופן לשילוב בין זכויות אדם ותקשורת. כלומר, קשה לחשוב על דוגמה יותר טובה, זאת אחת הסיבות העיקריות שבעטיין חשבתי שראוי להזמין מישהו שמכיר את הארגון הזה כל כך טוב, כי לארגון הזה, לאמנסט אינטרנשיונל, יש אכן אה, רקע ניכר ביחסים עם התקשורת. דוקטור סנה הוביל את הארגון בתקופה רבת תמורות. שנות התשעים של המאה הקודמת היו שנים שבהן נפל הגוש המזרחי, התמוטטו דיקטטורות בהרבה ממדינות הארצות, במיוחד באמריקה הלטינית. אולם בה בעת התרחשו בהן רצח העם ברואנדה, והמלחמה בבלקנים, ועוד ועוד ועוד, אנחנו לא נזכיר את כל השמות. מאפיין נוסף של התקופה היה כניסת התקשורת לדיווח צמוד מזירות אירועים. הופעת רשת כמו CNN שינתה את הזירה בעבור ארגוני זכויות אדם. ככל שהזמן חלף נוצר צורך לעסוק בהפרות זכויות אדם המוניות וכן למצוא נתיבים כיצד לתפקד לצד תקשורת שהפכה לחלק ניכר מפעילות המחקר של ארגונים למיותרת לכאורה. ידיעותיו הרבות וניסיונו העשיר של דוקטור סנה מבטיחים שעלינו לצפות להרצאה מעניינת במיוחד. אני לא אתרגם את הכותרת, Media and NGOs, Bad Fellows in Instrumentalization of Human Rights. סימן שאלה. בבקשה, דוקטור סנה. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Let me first start by uh, thanking Dr. Michael Elrich, who was uh, the chair of Amnesty International Israel. Uh, at the time I was leading the organization and thank the organization, the organizers of this conference for the invitation. I know that the focus of the conference is Israel and that my contribution may detract from that focus, but I take it that the organizers wanted some broader context and an international outlook to feed into the discussion. So I will not explicitly mention Israel, and I hope still that my remarks will meet the expectation of the organizers and the participants. To be clear, I am not speaking on behalf of Amnesty International. Amnesty International Israel is here represented by the chair of the Israeli section. And I'm not speaking, of course, on behalf of UNESCO, which I left two years ago. Let me bring you the greetings from Senegal, my country, where I now leave after an absence of 35 years, where I leave part of the time, the rest of the time being spent in Japan, where I teach at Doshisha University in Kyoto, and in Paris, where I run a project to establish a new think tank called Imagine Africa. The think tank will eventually be based in Africa in a couple of years and be dedicated to improving research and policy linkages in the field of social and economic development and South-South cooperation from a human rights foundation. The history of Africa, at least the modern history of Africa, as you all may know, is a long history, a long journey of human right deprivation and struggle against dehumanization. 
from the slave trade and deportation of millions of African male women and children to the Americas, to the colonial partitioning and occupation, the drafting of African men into European and world wars, forced labor, racial segregation, and the unanimity of apartheid, the proxy wars of the East-West confrontation, and today the human impact of a neoliberal economic and social agenda, Africa and the Africans have seen it all. That is why they value so much the march ahead of the human rights revolution. Because an international human rights regime is the key to restoring African dignity locally and internationally. Human rights in Africa is the difference between life and death. The right to food, the right to health, the right to education, freedom of association, freedom of expression, the right to security, the right to collective sovereignty are not abstract constructions. They are entitlement that today sustain the optimism of the African people despite adverse living conditions. The youth of a growing population combined with abundant natural resources have convinced many Africans that the future will be brighter than the past, provided that the human rights revolution does not go astray. As you can see, human rights for me is not just an engagement. It is a condition for the emergence of a strong and peaceful African society. It is a matter of survival for a continent that has long been a prey for foreign powers and unscrupulous local leaders. For me, therefore, defending human rights universally and defending Africa is one and the same thing. It is the same struggle. When human rights are violated with impunity anywhere, I, as an African, feel threatened because a dent on the international regime of human rights protection is a threat to those in the world who stand in a position of weakness, live in poor societies, powerless states, and are discriminated against. Their only shield is the rule of law of international human rights law everywhere. Which brings me to the role of the media, and especially of media in powerful countries who influence and shape our perception of the world around us in many ways. I led Amnesty International during a crucial period in the growth of the human rights movement and the pregnancy of human rights issue on the global media agenda that is in the 90s, more precisely, between 1992 and 2001. In the aftermath of the fall of the Berlin Wall and days before the deadly attacks on the Twin Towers. I led Amnesty during the period of the dismemberment of the Soviet Empire and the wars in the Balkans. The first Gulf War and crucifying sanctions against Iraqi people the Rwanda genocide and West African wars in Sierra Leone and Liberia, the Colombian insurgency and drug war at its nastiest peak, the height of the crackdown on Chinese dissidents, the Palestinian intifada, the Algerian civil war, Ethiopian famine and AIDS epidemics. But in the same period, the international community gathered in Rio de Janeiro, in Vienna, in Copenhagen, in Cairo, in Rome, in Geneva, and in Durban to renew its commitment to the international regime of human rights, strengthening, strengthening it by creating the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, 
the establishment of the International Criminal Court in the wake of the Rwanda and Yugoslav tribunals, agreeing resolutions that saw the expansions of national human rights commissions, gender policies, and anti-racist national plans, Millennium Development Goals centered of the objectives of eliminating poverty, illiteracy, and containing deadly diseases, all in the name of human rights, and last but not least, the phenomenal growth of the human rights movement with human rights civil society organization springing all over the world, congregating in fora such as the World Social Forum in Porto Alegre, to hammer the message that a different world is possible, a world of people before profit. It is in this period that human rights became a central feature in media reporting, albeit with all the shortcomings linked to the misunderstanding of the concept of human rights, the distortions linked to bias and prejudice, the, sensational, the sensationalism engendered by competition and market shares, and at time, the surrender to the pressure to serve the national interest, especially in situation of conflict and war. Let me illustrate this assertion through a few examples I experienced during my time at Amnesty International. For many, many media outlets in Europe and North America, human rights was often seen as an element of foreign policy and covered by the foreign desks. And this was reinforced by the focus of Amnesty International reports, always covering faraway places. Domestically, issues with strong human rights content were categorized differently. For instance, child abuse, refugees and immigration, police brutality, unemployment, sexual and racial discrimination were indeed covered, but as if there were no internationally agreed human rights standards and obligations deriving from international covenants and standards. I remember vividly the shock reflected in the press in Denmark when Amnesty International released in the early 90s its first report on police brutality in Denmark. Not that police brutality was a new phenomenon in the country, but that it warranted an Amnesty International report released internationally was intolerable to the Danish press, even though the reaction of the authorities was more reasonable. We documented close to 1,000 negative press articles, editorials, readers' reactions, interviews in a few months, attacking Amnesty's sense of priority or ill-judged drive to balance its coverage to distance itself from the label quote-unquote Western organization. We even lost membership, influenced as they were by the arguments of the media. Of course, the fact that an African necessarily guilty of third world militancy was running Amnesty International figured prominently, but only between the lines of the press posture. It took time to explain that Amnesty International covered human rights violations everywhere that all victims deserve attention, that international human rights law define universal standards, and that our goal was to draw the attention of the authorities to a rampant phenomena of impunity for police brutality. That misunderstanding about the content of human rights indeed leads to many human rights issues going underreported especially when it comes to reporting of economic issues. Social economic rights are systematically neglected or excluded because human rights are taken to mean civil and political rights only. 
This was brought to broad daylight in a strongly worded editorial of the magazine The Economist of August 2001, the very week where Amnesty International membership was holding its biannual council meeting to debate and adopt a resolution to expand its mandate to cover campaigning against violations of social and economic rights. The magazine dismissed these rights as mere aspirations, warning amnesty of the dilution of its action and loss of effectiveness, interference with complex economic policies being the prerogative of governments and best addressed by the interplay of market forces rather than ill-defined international standards." End of quote. This was 10 years ago. Today, with social protests taking to the streets of Wall Street, Athens, Madrid, Tel Aviv, Montreal, to defend and protect social entitlements and the right to work, it is clear that the move by Amnesty International has been vindicated. If people take to the street, it is clearly because they feel somewhere that an injustice is being committed, that their rights are being trampled upon, and that neoliberal policies and market forces are not delivering on the promises of prosperity for all in a world of globalized, in a world globalized by finance and free trade. Another misunderstanding in the media lies with the comprehension of the role of a human rights organization like Amnesty International, at least during my time. Media are, generated, are generators and sources of information. They gather, process, and present most of the information we receive about human rights violations around the world, choosing which stories to highlight, taking positions, calling for action. In doing so, they are also the carriers of the information generated by the human rights organizations. They are the gatekeepers between these organizations and the general public. They act as a filter, while NGO <laughs> act as a source. But an organization like Amnesty International, with its 1.5 million members, the information produced is not solely to feed the media machinery. The reports are primarily aimed at securing membership action, at providing them with a background with the relevant international standard violated by the events covered, and by providing recommendations for action, for campaigning, for lobbying, for press work, etc. The material is not necessarily always media savvy and would at times require extra work from media desks. I remember this interview I gave in the mid-90s to a reporter of the New York Times explaining that on one occasion it had to do with the illegal supply of arms to Rwandan fighters during the genocide. We had to reduce the process of checking and counter-checking our information because on the one hand we were reasonably satisfied with the reliability of the information and on the other hand we were faced with the urgency of membership action to prevent further shipment of arms. It was rendered in print as an admission of the lowering of the standards of accuracy of amnesty, and hence the questioning of amnesty as a reliable source for the media. Fortunately, we were vindicated by the findings of the UN investigations, which laid the matter to rest. This point to the need for the media to treat human rights organization as any other source of information. It does, not, it does not absolve them from performing their professional duties of fact-checking. This is not something to be delegated even to the most trustworthy source. I interpreted the tone of the article 
as if AI information could not just be reprinted as is, thus giving more work to the journalist. Information in the Western world is more and more treated as a commodity, and media houses are not just out there to promote open debate, provide reliable information, expose wrongdoing and corruption, and explain the impact of events on the world in which we live. It is now very much a part of the corporate world, sharing and <coughs> promoting the values and interests of corporate owners. Of course, this is not true of all media outlets, but concentration is a growing reality with the preeminence of conglomerates <coughs> such as News Corp of Robert Murdoch, AOL Time Warner in the USA. The same process is taking place in most advanced countries, giving media organizations undue power and influence over the legislative process on issues such as ownership and competition rules, tax laws, advertising, and even violence on television. Commitment to the bottom line is exerting pressure on reporting. Political bias, prejudice, selectivity, and sensationalism, negativism, are all too often the bedfellows of this process of concentration and competition. Just watch Fox News any night or follow the proceedings of the UK Parliamentary Commission of Inquiry into the methods of British tabloids. I was confronted firsthand with this sensationalism and deliberate negative reporting when I attended the Durban World Conference which outcome is still demonized in the mainstream Western media. What happened in Durban? It is true that the USA and Israel staged a dramatic walkout. It is true that the wording of the final statement gave rise to impassioned debates. It is true that the Arab-Israeli conflict invited itself once again in the proceedings of the NGO conference where improper language was used, leading to the rejection of the report by the High Commissioner of Human Rights at the time, Mary Robinson. But this is not the only thing that happened in Durban. I was there throughout, leading the delegation of UNESCO. Like in previous world conferences I attended, Vienna, Rome, Rio, etc. This one also ended with a consensus declaration and a viable plan of action for states and international organizations to combat racism. It is true after heated debates, like in Beijing on women's rights, like in Vienna on human rights. The conference enlisted the participations of thousands of groups representing victims of racism, like the Pygmies from Central Africa, the Dalits from South Asia, Afro-Latins, Roms, Gypsies, Sindhis, and other traveling people, all victims of a racism ignored by the international community. For these victims, this was a significant achievement brought by Durban. For the African participants, the qualification for the first time of the slave trade as a crime against humanity represented a significant step in the recognition of the wrongs inflicted to the continent. All this was evacuated by the mainstream press who hastened to label the qualification of failure to the conference. I beg to differ. Judging by the outcome and the challenge of anti-racism struggle in the 21st century, it was not a failure. Now, I don't want to be misunderstood, and this will be my concluding remarks. The examples I have highlighted are not meant to present a good guy, bad guy dichotomy in the relations between human rights NGOs and the media. 
too often, NGOs fail to factor in the fact that the media and human rights organizations play distinct and different but equally vital roles in creating open societies and have different roles and responsibilities. The single-mindedness and focus of human rights organizations cannot be expected to be replicated by a media confronted with conflicting demands and expectation of a readership not necessarily concerned with all human rights violations everywhere, every day. And again, these are stories and examples of the 20th century. I left Amnesty International in 2001. Since then, it has been a different century and a different story that I leave to others to tell. Thank you very much.